so we're talking here to uh, Professor Ian Robbins. It's uh, Tuesday, 28th of uh, November. We are somewhere near Oxford Street in, in central London. And um, I asked, um, I asked uh, Dr. Robbins that what words of advice you would give to someone who's uh, been through severe trauma, who's possibly been in prison or been through torture or been through a very traumatic experience caused by other people. Um, they've come out of it now. Um, some are unsure whether they should, uh, should they seek some sort of uh, assistance should they um should they just you know is it okay to be angry or to or to um some of them are angry some of them are bitter some of them they they want revenge some of them are in denial they just want to shut it off and um you know you're talking to someone like me what what do you say to me i think one of the things is to think about why people put you in detention in the first place or engage in torture they do it for lots of reasons, um, but one of the reasons they have is to leave you damaged at the end of it. And that damage is obvious when you find that you're reliving the experience constantly, either in your head or sometimes in flashbacks. You find that you have to avoid things because they act as triggers and they make you really distressed. Or you find that um, you're losing interest in your normal activities, your friendships, your relationships, or you're incredibly jumpy, angry, irritable. And those are all things that are changed because of the experience you've gone through. Now you can either just try and pretend it's not there, or you think about how can you change it. Sometimes people spontaneously improve. But particularly when people have been detained in torture, you're talking about the first five or six months after their release, and they gradually improve. And that may be enough. But for some people, there's still a large residue of problems relating to the past that they haven't processed. It sort of tends to hit you after a while, because when yes. you come back, or you come back from prison, or you come out, you're, there's that sudden sense of, um, there's that initial celebration or euphoria, and... and and then after a while it comes back, a few months or maybe a year where the people around you start to get fed up or there's something we spoke about that. Yes, and, and friends and family move on a lot quicker than you do. So initially they're incredibly supportive and even though they stay supportive, they seem to lose the understanding of what you're struggling with because it doesn't seem obvious why you might still be struggling with the problems after a year or two years down the line. Um, they sort of expect you to move on because they... Yes, you're back, in, you're back in your normal life and everything should just be normal after that. But sometimes you've got to take active um, control over it to make it happen. And one of the things I think really is most useful is to see everything that you change positively as an act of resistance in relation to the people who put you there in the first place. So every bit of your life that you reclaim is part of that process of resistance. And a way to help that reclaiming of your life is to talk with somebody who's experienced in working with people who've been tortured and detained and go through the events in a lot of detail and look at how those events in the past are shaping things in the present. And particularly the things that act as triggers for memories, how to lay down new memories, and how to process the emotions with those memories. Sometimes the emotions come without the memories being attached or the other way around, and it just leads to a sense of bewilderment because you don't really understand what's going on with things. And I think this process of gradually working through things and then looking at what's going on in your life now, how can I change these things, and how can I regain the sort of life I want? What you can't do is go back to exactly how you were five years ago or ten years ago. That's not possible. Yeah. I'm not the man I was five or ten years ago. And we all change. But what you want to do is to move to a, having a life that you're comfortable with and you feel in control of the past, not dominated by it. And I think it's a sense of being dominated and controlled by events of the past, which is the most distressing and depressing. I think people just feel defeated by it. 
one of the things that I, I benefited a lot from from the experience uh, from the, um, the advice that you gave me was about um, this point you just mentioned about uh, recreating um, recreating uh, new memories mm. and you told me to go to the places or the police station or the prison or, or, or the houses or the locations where I had some residues of traumatic mm. experiences or memories um, I mean, what was the benefit? I mean, I found it very beneficial, but what's like the the what's the the reasoning? What's what's the the, the rationale behind doing something like that? Because most people do not want to go back to a place where you had a car accident or you you you're beaten up. You don't want to do that. It's completely natural not to want to go back. Um, in fact, it'd be odd to want to go to those places. But the main reason is to stop those places even on an unconscious level, and have, have them control over you so that they trigger your emotions, they trigger your um, physical reactions, all the, your mental reactions, whether you want it or not. Um, and by going back to them and confronting them, you're laying down new memories associated with the places, you're stopping them being able to have that power over you. And sometimes it takes one or two sessions, uh, sometimes a single visit can do it. Mm. Um, there are times though when you can't go back to a place and it's sometimes using something that gets close to it and recreates some of the sense of emotion with it um, and that you can either do that in your imagination you can use videos um, of a place and try and intensively involve yourself in it and rethink what went on there in one case with somebody who'd been in a horrendous helicopter crash there's no way we could get a helicopter um, and so the nearest thing we could find to it was a car wash we had lots of noise going around we were trapped in this little car things whirring around outside wow and that in itself helped us with this man to reprocess what had gone on and we were talking through what had happened in that setting and so it's getting the thing that's closest or works best to trigger some of the same emotions and then be able to get control of them. One one of the things that you um one of the things that people who've been through when you've been in prison for a number of years, one of the things that I mean that I struggled with was breaking out of a routine. So mm -hmm. for years I'd lived where my routine was the same. Um, my food is going to come at a certain mm -hmm. time. The vegetables are going to be here. The dessert will be here. The rice will be here. Um, there's, the, there's a lockup will be at this time. It's a complete routine which I lived for for years. Yes. So then when I came back, I struggled with um, breaking out of that routine. Like everything, my whole day has to be planned in advance. And if something was thrown into it, it would upset me. I mean, what is one of the ways um, to, to, to deal with something like that? This is the, the, the hard one because you've got to deliberately accept that this is going to cause you a lot of anxiety as soon as you start to break that routine. Having that routine, packing your day is very successful for you when you're in prison, but it keeps you completely shackled if you carry on like that when you get out. So it's starting to gradually shift that routine, doing things that are spontaneous, stopping having your food at the same time, having different foods than you would normally have planned, um, being willing to go off your plan if something spontaneous happens and to start with you'll feel guilty or you'll feel anxious and it's being able to tolerate the fact it makes you uncomfortable none of this comes without a cost everything you try and change makes you feel uncomfortable and in a way that's a guide to whether you're on the right track because if something is easy to do it's probably not one of the most relevant bits. Mm. If you're struggling with it and it makes you uncomfortable, then you know you're addressing some of the things that you really need to go for. I mean, one of the other things that... Um, one of the things that people... Um, a lot of people, for them, it's, OK, I came out of prison three years ago, or OK, it's been 10 years since I was tortured. I don't think about it. That's my way of dealing with it. Now, I've been fine you know for, for all of these years and um, if I'm going to go like why fix something that ain't broke if I'm going to now go to a go to therapy or something I need to start talk about these things which I've like dealt with mm -hmm. um, why do I need to do that and but then on the other hand sometimes you'll see that 
these emotions, they're still there somewhere in the body and they come out in uncontrollable ways through short temper or they'll come away through irrational behaviors. We mentioned something about the emotions, how they heal. Uh, well, I, in a sense, if you are being completely honest with yourself and you have no reaction to things in the past, um, they're not triggering emotional responses, you don't find yourself dominated by it, you probably have already processed it to a large extent. It may not be perfect, but it might be enough. But if you're honest with yourself and you find that things are being triggered that you don't like, um, or behaviours being pushed in a direction you don't like by either things from the past or things associated with it, or you find that Sometimes the emotional reaction to an event is not just about the event, it's because it's associated with things from the past. Then you probably do need to do something about it. And that's when the talking process does help you. By bringing the events, the memories and the emotions into the present to talk about them, you process them in the, that period and that stops them being a trouble. But if you just use denial, and these things are really still happening to you, then you're, you've got a problem. But if you're having no um, trouble with the emotional reactions, you probably have processed it, and that's okay. But it doesn't mean that things, if things happen at a later date, you may still benefit from that talking process. I've known people who've done incredibly well, and then in later life have had problems. And I think in a large way, they were using their life as a way of blocking the events of the past. What, what's, what's time? I mean, sometimes people say that, oh, time is the best is the best healer and it heals. I mean, you mentioned something about um, veterans who were prisoners of war in Japanese um, concentration camps that you uh, dealt with. And then, I mean, did 40 or 50 years on, did time just resolve their, their, their issues? Absolutely. And if you look at the research on these um, people, nothing was happening for many years after the war. It's when they started to get to their 60s um, that they suddenly, people became interested in researching and that was partly because they were presenting with problems for the first time. And I think the reason they were presenting with problems is they'd use their life as a um, way of blocking things. So you have a family, you have a career, you're busy with hobbies. And then of course your family grow up, your career becomes less important, you're moving to retirement. And then some of these things start to dominate your thinking. And that's, uh, I think, really interesting when that happens because one of the things that I found joyful was that if you work with people at that point, even 50 or 60 years on, you can make a difference. And you wow. stop them being dominated by things of the past. There used to be a lot of pessimism around that if you hadn't treated people early on after traumatic events, then they were going to be stuck with it. And I think it's not the case. I think sometimes the trauma hasn't had its consequences because you've been too busy with your life. And it may be later on. But if you do something then, and it's relatively short term, you know, the average length of time, even after 50, 60 years, was sometimes 10 or 15 sessions. It wasn't, you know, that you sign up for therapy and that you do it all the time afterwards. Yes. Sometimes a very brief period is enough to help you sort out what's going on and get back on track again. I mean, what's what's the best way to to benefit from from therapy? I mean, you know, let's say I, I know someone who who I feel would benefit, and mm. I just need to drag him into the room, and um, and then that should be it. I mean, because once I've dragged him here, then th that would be it. I think it's I think it's harder than that. If you've got to get people to a point where they're ready to think that therapy's got something to offer, they've got to see a value in it, and they've also got to approach it as something that's work. Um, you spend an hour with your therapist, but you may spend several hours working on things that you've discussed. The things you work on will be difficult. You'll struggle with them. And those are the things that make the difference in your life. So the treatment isn't really in that one hour when you're sitting talking to someone, that's not going to really change your life, but it's the sort of catalyst or the advice or something that the tips that you're given, and then you practice those or you work because really this is something that you need to, to, to heal yourself. Is that, and that that's mostly it. you're doing it to yourself. It's being the therapist purely acts as the catalyst. 
and just is somebody who can stand back a bit and because they're not a close relative or close friend they can accept that some of the things they're going to ask you to do are going to upset you and make, make you very distressed but they know in the end that it's going to help you process that and come through it. Friends and family often can't do that because as soon as they start to make you upset they back off yeah. and it becomes something you can't talk about after a while. Yes, you just shut down. What are, in your experience, I mean, you've treated, as we mentioned, Japanese prisoner of war, um, uh, veterans, you've treated uh, Holocaust survivors, refugees, victims of torture, or mm. war victims. I mean, what are sort of the symptoms if if someone is having, I'm sure they, 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 they vary, but if someone is experiencing these things that he should think, are these things happening to me because maybe I've got some unresolved trauma lurking around in my system or my memory somewhere or what, what sort of system? I mean, I know there's many, just a few you could run off the top of your head. What sort of behaviours? Well, the main things are about being dominated by the past, that you can't get it out of your head, that lots of things can act as triggers for those memories. When you get the memories, they're upsetting. You often find that you've got high levels of arousal, you're a bit jumpy, hypervigilant for threat, um, you become angry, irritable, and you lose interest in friends, family, relationships, jobs. And people often use things as a way of trying to block it. So it may be alcohol, sometimes it's drugs, um, maybe heavy avoidance, so you find that your life's being controlled because you're avoiding places or people or things that remind you of the events in the past. It's like you're fighting a battle from the moment you wake up till you go to sleep. Yes. And um, what about, I mean, one of the things that I struggled with was, um, which I still haven't quite been able to get, out, get over, is this, um, this inability to multitask. Now, men generally have difficulties <laughs> with multitasking, but I find that I was able to do it before I went away to prison. But since I've got back... Yeah. I've got this, if I'm starting something, I have to finish it. I can't do a conversation while I'm, because I'll forget the thing that I was focused on. I mean, why does it happen? Is, is that normal? And what's one of the ways that in your experience, you've, have you seen that before? And how did you treat something like that? Or it, It's a really, really common thing. There's this, most of us have a, a, an ability. Common for who? Common for someone? People who've gone through extreme trauma. Okay. Most of us have this ability to, for instance, in a busy room, have a conversation with one person and be partly listening to somebody else's conversation. After trauma, you just can't do that. They seem to be, I think, we're used to multi-channel processing in the way we approach the world. That's how we yes. come to judgments quickly and accurately. And sometimes a lot of that ability is being tied up with other processing because you're processing things that might relate to events from the past, threat, all sorts of things, and you don't have that ability to do it. Partly the way to deal with it is to go through this process of dealing with the events of the past. But then also doing things that build up your concentration. And that can be anything from card games through to computer games through to pen and paper tasks. It's anything. And then you, in the course of doing those things, you deliberately shift your focus back and forwards from one thing to the next. I mean, computer games, a lot of... Um... A lot of uh, parents will be horrified to hear something like that. A lot of children would be uh, overjoyed. Yes. I mean, <laughs> does it actually work? Do you have any experiences where it's actually, you've seen it, it actually works for someone to be able to multitask after playing computer games? It's about being able to attend to things in lots of different modalities simultaneously. The way to use computer games effectively, you've got to be able to coordinate what's going on on the screen, what you're hearing, your hands... Um, and because of the way they're set up, they are powerful things, so they are a bit addictive. Yes. But I found that they, years ago, before it was fashionable, I was looking at computer games as an aid to recovery following head injuries, very severe head injuries. Okay. And it improved people's concentration, it improved their hand-eye coordination, but also it improved their willingness to engage with people around them more. Wow. And so, and these were the simple early computer games, which most children would find dull now. Yes. Um, but the, the modern ones, I think, are incredibly useful for that. 
but it's that they don't become a substitute for the real life. Yes. That you use them as part of a process and you do them for a given period of time. Yes. And also sometimes you set them as a reward. So if you've done something particularly difficult, you do 10 minutes on or the computer half an hour for on the computer game. And because of scores and things like that, you can actually see how you're progressing. So you can see how your ability to multitask, I mean, it's one way of actually seeing if it's working or not, if you're doing yes. better or not. And if you look at the scores, to start with, you get a, a quick improvement, then you start to plateau. It's anything where you build from that initial improvement and plateauing that you know you're really improving. Okay. Some people say that people believe that trauma or having some of these symptoms that you said or having gone through something which is like, like they say trauma is an act of, it's a sign of weakness. That means that you're like, you're not a strong person. You're actually a weak person because you can't deal with it. You can't handle it. I mean, in prison, I met a lot of uh, um, uh, soldiers, army veterans, soldiers and and some of them uh, not they weren't prison some of them were actually prison officers and they used to tell me how they there's this pressure on them just to like just man it up and, and just you know come and you know you, you're weak or I mean is, is having trauma is it, is it a sign of weakness is it is it uh, that's one of the things that stops a lot of people wanting to accept or wanting to even get some treatment because they don't want to especially men have fragile egos they don't want to be able to I, I think that's the hardest thing I think most men particularly but not just men women as well feel a sense of shame about the fact they've been vulnerable um, and the reality is if the trauma is big enough and bad enough and prolonged enough almost everybody will be affected by it okay but also it's a different event you can be at the same event and your perception of how close you are to being killed may be different from the person next to you and it's that perception of the event as well as the event itself that's really important okay and so you may respond to something differently, and that's partly shaped by our past, our personalities. But it's mostly the severity of the event, if things are bad enough, most people will be affected. I mean, so is it fair to say that trauma is actually injury? Like, if you were to, like, trip over and uh, break your arm, mm. you wouldn't just man it up. You know, it doesn't mean you're a weak person, you're a human being. So you go to the hospital, you'd get it seen to it, then you'd get on with your life. That, that's exactly it. Um, but because it's anything that's seen as being psychological is seen as self-inflicted or a weakness. And that sense of shame prevents people going for treatment in a way that they think they'd laugh if you suggested that you should just be able to, by strength of willpower, heal your own broken leg. I mean, when I first started um, coming to sessions with you, one of the... Um I mean, I was a bit, I mean, I knew that there's issues that I want to get resolved, but one of the things that, I mean, there's, there's a, a 1% doubt, is it just all in the mind or does it actually exist? And I remember we went through an exercise where um, you made me shut my eyes and relive the uh, police assault on me. And uh, I mean, even though I'd done it hundreds of times, I've told, you in, in know, testified about it in court I've spoken spoken to lawyers to friends family but this time you sort of made me do it in real time to recreate the smells the accents of the police officers to and after I did that I noticed that I mean first of all I was pretty shaken up it mm. took about 20 yes. minutes but then for two or three days after that my wrists where the officer had like uh, manipulated the handcuffs mm my wrists were actually hurting for about two or three days. Absolutely. I mean, they were actually hurting. It wasn't in my yeah. mind. I mean... Those are the memories of the event, the physical memories of the event that were never processed, never even labelled. Okay. But I think if you need an indication that it's real, that process of reliving, where somebody takes you through it in a way that you haven't got complete control over, because most of us develop a, a way of rushing through a narrative of what's happened to us in a way that means you don't have to engage with the emotions associated with it. You've rehearsed it, you've planned it, you yes. can tell people and you feel in control of it. Yes. Um, and that's not a good indication just because you can do that because most yes. of us, if we do it's a party trick. Yes. But if you are taken through it in a way where you're asked questions, you're having to rewind a bit, explain things, describe things you haven't rehearsed, mm. 
and you start to get an effect, then you know just how real it and is. It, it hurt for two or three days and yes. I did feel uncomfortable but after yeah. that I felt like a mountain had been lifted off yes. my shoulders yes. so just to wrap up um, just any final words for someone who, who's struggling with it may not be war or, or, or torture or, or it, it could be I mean, I mean you yourself you're in final stages of, 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 of cancer mm. you're, there's people struggling with, with bereavement mm. with, with, with cancer with domestic violence with with I mean, a lot of our conversation was about the, you know, something that most people thankfully wouldn't go through. But um, any words of advice, just the last few parting words that you would say to someone who's struggling with these things? I think is not to turn it into a, another thing that you either succeed or fail at. It's to see this as a process and that you deal with it, but new events may come along and you revisit the process. It doesn't mean you failed or you reverted or gone downhill it just means that something else you hadn't initially thought of um, still needs a bit of work on and so you may do it in several stages okay. it's not all or nothing you don't have to suddenly go to your therapist spend 20 sessions and that's the way you may do a few sessions you may go away and work on stuff and then a year or two later you may need a little bit more help but that's not um, a sign of weakness it's a sign that you're processing things and that you need to rethink why something else is now having this effect on you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. So just before I, uh, um, I say, yeah, let me just point the camera just, <laughs> just to, to make sure it's authentic. And, and I, I am actually here, so I'm not sure if the, if the, if the camera is going to I'm not sure if it's going to see me. Yes. So I'm actually here. It's yeah. not like do, we're not we're not doing some <laughs> psychological trick or something like that. No. But um, uh, just also on the camera, I just wanted to say, uh, Dr. Robbins, that uh, I have benefited very, very much from. I've had almost twenty sessions uh, uh, with you over mm. the last couple of years. Um, I have benefited a lot. It has helped my recovery. Um, the advice that you've given, and I'm sure there are a lot of people that are alive today and are living very fulfilled lives with their um, with their families and those around them because of the um, the difference that you have made uh, uh, to mm -hmm. their life so um, you know we wish you all the best as much as we can in these difficult stages uh, for you but um, you know you should definitely not forget that your uh, life has made a difference in the lives of a lot of people. Thank you. And I have to say it's been a pleasure working with you. And one of the reasons it's been a pleasure is because you have really treated it as some work. That you've put the effort in and as a consequence you've made a lot of improvement. And that's the best way ever to approach um, seeking help of any sort. Brilliant. Thank you very much.